Now I go to the second part, which is uh, very different because it's about the church. It's about prayer and the ecclesiality of it. First, uh, let's familiarize ourselves with some passages in the Bible. You know, let's read the passage that our Lord taught in Matthew chapter 18, verses 90 to 20. I tell you the truth, if two of you agree on earth about anything, they want to ask my Father in heaven will give it to them. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Uh, so far, we have highlighted that we need to pray. We have to be very intimate to God. And we have been giving importance to that prayer that is so personal, so friendly. As a son of God, uh, likewise. Now, we have studied also our relationship with the Trinity, prayer and the Trinity, and we saw our mother. Now, we look at the ecclesiality of prayer. Now, how is it connected, now, the church and prayer? And here in this first passage, our Lord himself mentioned, that he also you know, um, was recommending that we pray with the others. And his presence is different in that prayer. When two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Next passage is that of the Acts of the Apostles. This is now the story of the church. After receiving the word of God, after receiving the story of his life and being evangelized, they started living their lives in prayer. And Acts 2.42 mentions some detail about that. Okay. They devoted yeah. themselves to the apostles' teaching and, and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. So, as a church, they were uh, doing the liturgy, the breaking of the bread, and they were praying together. Uh, Acts 2.42 tells us the early Christians had dedicated time for the breaking of the bread and the prayers. Acts 12.5 uh, gives us also another idea of how the early Christians lived when they were in trouble, when they were in stress. So Peter was shut up in prison while the church prayed to God continually for him. So the subject in this sentence is the church. All the members of the Christian community formed part of the church. They were all baptized and they are praying for Peter and his freedom. His liberation that's very important is the pope no so they pray continually for peter all these passages reveal to us the need to pray also with the others to pray collectively there's a text of saint paul that even highlights the ecclesiastic prayer and you find that in romans chapter 15 verse 5 to 6. Uh, may the god of patience and consolation give you one mind among yourselves in Christ Jesus, that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I highlighted there a few things. The unity of mind or the unity of soul. They had one intent each time the church. They were with one voice, one accord. Huh? They were in harmony. They were praying for the same thing. And that is for the glory of God glory of Jesus Christ as well, glory of the Blessed Trinity. So um, St. Paul highlights here the need for our prayer to be ecclesial, you know? that our prayer is always possessing that characteristic of being church-based, you know? church-founded. You know? There is no prayer that is outside the context of the church. We already said previously that the church in Christ, rather, uh, that Christ's prayer is never in separated from us. No, we always pray in Him. We say in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We enter the dynamics of the Trinity every time we pray. We pray with Christ, in Christ, and through Christ. Now, we know in theology that Christ is never separated from the church because He is the head of the church. You remove Christ and you don't have the church anymore. No? The mystical body of Christ always has the head. So we cannot separate Christ from the church. Therefore, if we say that our prayer is always in, with, and through Christ, we can also affirm that our prayer is always in, with, and through the church. Just like the early Christians and just like the Christians of our day. It is always ecclesial. Okay, We, have, we point out here and we will elaborate on this further. 
it is because of the action of the Holy Spirit that moves us with one accord, one mind, one voice. It's a different thing already when we pray. The person is responsible for that. When we attribute everything, this third person, blessed Trinity, okay, he acts in us. And when he acts, he always acts thinking in the context of always in unison of, with in communion with the entire church. So ecclesiality of prayer is because of the action of the Holy Spirit. Besides, there is a dogma of our faith called the communion of saints, which could mean many things. Uh, communion of those in church and in heaven, communion of the faith, communion of the sacraments, but also communion in prayer. Communion expressed in prayer. Last but not the least, now in prayer, it is there is always some ecclesiality that is an internal characteristic because we exercise this great commandment of Christ, fraternal love in prayer first and foremost. Okay, We pray for one another, we pray for each other, and we receive the prayer of the others. When we think of prayer, always in the context of communion of saints, therefore, uh, we pray always with the church. It could never be separated from that. When we pray, we always pray with communion, in communion with the rest, members faithful of the church. Everything that was mentioned is pretty clear when we think of the liturgy. When you say liturgical prayer, these are the mass, the, the masses, the breviaries, the sacraments, Breviary is the prayer for the priest, and liturgies of the hours, etc., etc. Um, it's always connected to the church. Christ is always mentioned with the church, etc., etc. We say things officially. Um, the, the church is praying each time. We are always in communion with one another in spite of the number of people attending. But when it comes to vocal prayers, when it comes to personal prayers, perhaps it's a question that many of us are asking. Perhaps it's a question that is not so clear for us. How could the personal prayer, how could an individualist prayer, be also ecclesial? Even the non-liturgical prayers, the personal piety that I have, how could that be also considered church-based or church-founded or ecclesial? And we can also approach the problem using all these questions that I posted in, uh, that, are, that are here right now. In my prayer, Personal prayer, personal piety, therefore, which is important, more important, my individual prayer, the fact that I am praying alone, or is, is there something better? Is community prayer better than individual prayer? We could also ask ourselves, no? is prayer in a better community more effective? So, for example, you are praying the rosary. No? Um, is it better to have others join you? No? Of course, we know that when it comes to family praying of the rosary, there is an indulgence, but that's a different matter altogether. But the, the value of the prayer itself, is it better when done with the others in community? Or if the people in the community are holier, or if we are more, if we are 10 only praying the rosary, should we invite more you know, so that it's 1,000 and that's better in front of God? You know? The more people praying together, is it better really? There's a response that uh, clarifies everything, no? and it perhaps uh, could provide us the answer. It's in a document by the Congregation Doctrine of Faith. Um, we review the concepts we mentioned earlier, the arguments, and this, and I think it's the answer is pretty clear. Oratoris Formas number seven. The prayer of Jesus has been given to the church. This is how you should pray. For this reason, Christian prayer, even when done alone, always takes place within that communion of saints in which and for which one prays both publicly and liturgically and privately. I think this pretty much summarizes the answers to all those issues I raised. Now. Which is better, the individual prayer, especially the, the one of the non-liturgical, no? individual prayer versus the community prayer. The document tells us that Jesus gave the prayer gave the capacity to talk to God, gave the grace of prayer to the church. And that's why the Christian prayer, although you may be alone reciting it, the personal vocal prayer, 
even when done alone, is always in communion with the saints. And because of that, it has the same value, even if you're with the others. Okay? Liturgically and privately, or publicly versus privately, uh, you're always in communion with saints. The communion of saints means that you, I mean, it's not understood in the physical sense. No? When you're praying alone, and you are always in communion with the others, the prayer that is inauthentic, or is not genuine, or not real, or a bad prayer, is the prayer that is schismatic, or heretical, or is not in communion with the church. Okay? Or the prayer that takes, it, takes you out of love, no? The prayer, for example, that's the most false is wishing bad or evil for another person. Obviously, that's not genuine prayer. In fact, it goes against the rules of prayer. But every time you pray, you're always in communion with the saints, and therefore, it always is ecclesial. Although it may not be liturgical, personal prayer of the Christian, therefore, Christian prayer is always in communion with the saints, in communion with the saints, and always ecclesial. Okay? So if you have five persons praying the rosary, that's also okay. If you are alone praying the rosary, that also is very okay because that is always in communion with saints. Unless you reject that, that dogma of our faith. No? That is completely fine. Okay? The one that provides the ecclesiality of it all, of prayer, is the third person of Blessed Trinity. And the Catechism of the Catholic Church further explains this point to settle everything. It's point 2672. The Holy Spirit, whose anointing permits our whole being, is the interior teacher of Christian prayer. He is the architect of the living tradition of prayer. Certainly, there are as many ways in prayers as there are people praying. But it is the same Spirit who acts in everyone and with everyone. It is in the communion of the Holy Spirit that Christian prayer is prayer in the church mentioned in another way because every time you pray it is the spirit that gives you the words gives you the teaching gives you the form he's the architect as well it's always within the communion of saints it's always prayer in the church now, so it gives us a perhaps great peace no even we're alone we're reciting the rosary it is always in communion with us with the saints it is always ecclesial likewise there are two schools of thought, um, in general, especially the Second Vatican Council um, after the reform, and that is putting a contradiction between personal prayer and liturgical prayer, sometimes excessively highlighting the importance of one or the other. Edith Stein, philosopher, a lecturer, a good teacher, who later on became a Carmelite, could clarify this for us, that there's really no contradiction you know, between a subjective prayer personal prayer vis-a-vis -vis an objective or a liturgical prayer. Uh, Interior prayer released from all traditional forms and thought of a subjective piety cannot be opposed to the liturgy or objective prayer of the church. All authentic prayer is a prayer of the church and it is the church herself who prays there because it is the Holy Spirit who lives in her who in each soul intercedes for us with ineffable neurons. Romans chapter 8, 26. This is precisely what authentic prayer is, for no one can say, Lord Jesus, except in the Holy Spirit. What would the prayer of the church be if it were not for the surrender of great lovers to God, who is love? Well, I highlighted there the two propositions, very simple, of St. Teresa Benedict of the Cross. Benedict of the Cross. Interior prayer cannot be opposed to the prayer outside, external, objective. Subjective versus the objective. There's no contradiction at all. And in fact, her, her affirmation is this. All authentic prayer is prayer of the church. Even that one of you that you reciting the rosary. That one that you, you, you practice of very popular piety. You know, um, just to mention to you, some people, they see, especially after the Second Vatican Council, they see the liturgical prayer as simply something that doesn't affect them. That doesn't uh, perhaps is so important for them because they're told to go to mass, and uh, but they could not connect, and so what they do is they bring the rosary. Uh, maybe some of you have seen it, no? the films, the videos of our grandmothers. They bring the rosary in mass and they pray the rosary there, because they're required to attend mass. But at the same time, they want they don't want to waste their time, 
So they just pray the rosary there. No, personal prayer. No? Um, I think this text clarifies it no? for us. There's no contradiction in the two. There is harmony. Because it's the Holy Spirit who lives in her, in the church, in each soul interceding for us in ineffable cross. Because it's the Holy Spirit that moves both prayers. The liturgical and also the personal. St. John Paul II, Benedict XVI, and also recently Pope Francis would in fact mention the importance of popular piety. And of course, as always, the liturgical prayer as well. And would give some guidelines on how to harmonize the two. Edith Stein is a very important figure of the church. No? She is a, a genius, an intellectual who got converted. Um, when she got converted, the hierarchy, the church authorities, they were telling her, why don't you continue lecturing because you're doing a lot of good. On the other hand, she decides to be a Carmelite. And she goes to contemplative prayer. And so people have been attacking contemplative prayer, meaning the prayer of the nuns, the prayer isolated. What use is that? No? Well, if we understand the harmony between liturgical prayer and the personal prayer, we realize that this prayer is always important because it's a prayer of the church in both ways. Okay, just to reiterate the point, a harmony is necessary between the liturgical and the personal prayer, both are also necessary. We need to personalize our prayer. We need to be very intimate with our Lord. We need to have our own words, yes. But we also need the liturgy. We cannot isolate our personal prayer from the prayer of the church. And we understand that these two support and feeds and enriches the other. Personal prayer would feed, would support, would enrich liturgical prayer and vice versa. We know that every form of prayer, including the personal prayer, is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. And Jesus Christ comes through the liturgy. The source of all prayer is the liturgy, is the Eucharist. On the other hand, as a practical tip, therefore, so that we harmonize this liturgical and personal prayer, we have to see the Mass, the sacraments, and the liturgy also from a personal point of view, to personalize the Mass. There are many ways of doing this. For example, focusing on a text, focusing on a word, for example, sacred scripture, or in the liturgy, you know, the Lord be with you and with your spirit. For example, just focusing on that and seeing the spiritual, the effect of that in our very personal circumstances. No? God is with me. I am always with His Spirit, etc., etc. We can also perhaps no, uh, personalize the Mass by through the gestures. No, um, So there are many ways of doing this. As Saint Jose Maria had advised and will come out in many of the lectures of TFR, how to personalize. When we discuss, in fact, the Holy Mass no, and the parts of it no, in, in the previous lecture, um, we talked about this, no, how to somehow personalize each part of the Mass. To uh, illustrate further the harmony between the personal and the liturgical prayer, we have St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, very interesting, in the 13th century, there was a popular piety no, and the miracles towards or revealing to us the importance of the Eucharist. The Eucharistic miracles took place, and likewise, there was so much devotion to the Blessed Sacrament. Now, uh, the Pope realized this, and he wanted to institute the Feast of Corpus Christi. And so he asked a saint, he asked an ingenious, an intellectual, to compose through his piety something that could be used in the liturgy. And so he did, through five hymns, he wrote this pen. No? These are Laudation, or Ecce Panis Angelorum. If you attended Mass last Sunday, before the Alleluia, or the acclamation of the Gospel, you must have recited this. No? A beautiful hymn that is a sequence of the Corpus Christi Mass. On the Panis Angelicus, the Bread of Angels, or this glad solemnity, recited in the Office of Readings, also of the Liturgy. In the Matins, we pray, we priest the Verbum Supernum. The last two stanzas are the ones that is most popular because they were converted into hymns 
when we have benedictions, o salutaris ostia is sung, especially in the Philippines. No? In other countries, it's Panjalingwa. There are other versions of uh, songs or hymns recited in or sung in the benediction. The heavenly word that is uh, the hymn of the matins, and then Panjalingwa, the hymn of the vespers. Uh, we sing the last two uh, stanzas, Tantum Ergo. So the personal piety of a, of a man, Saint Thomas Aquinas, was turned into something liturgical. Now it was the uh, you would say the harmonious relationship between liturgical prayer because liturgical prayer was handed to us also because of the personal piety of people. I mentioned an anecdote. Uh, this is very important. Eh? The the piety we have in mass now because objectively um, we see the same things. Now, but if our hearts are attuned to what is happening or has that love in the liturgy, then it's a totally different thing. Uh, when Saint Jose Maria was crossing the Pyrenees, sometimes he would have the opportunity to celebrate Mass. No, and when he would celebrate Mass, the people are always dumbstruck. No? And they, one even wrote in his diary, I don't know why I've always attended Mass, but it's because perhaps of the priest. No? The priest who was pious, who was realizing that before his hands is the transubstantiated Lord, no? our Lord, present body, blood, soul, and divinity. And, and this, St. John Mary Vianney also had his uh, own uh, stories. No? This is not only for priests. No? The piety of priests is not the, the, the most detrimental of this. It is your piety, how you attend Mass, how you not only passively go through each, but to personalize. No? personalized. The mass works ex opere operato, meaning by the mere fact it is done, there is a great benefit for all those attending. But at the same time, ex opere operantis, by the mere fact it is done, there is some benefit to each subjectively. So the way you attend mass, the way you put your mind there, the way you personalize it, no, is perhaps so crucial in this. Okay, uh, just to finish, we have one more slide here about prayer and the church. Now, prayer, in fact, fulfills the mission of the church. You find there in the first point that there in prayer, we have the value and effectiveness apostolically by itself or in itself. You see on the, in the photos there, two saints or patrons of the missions. One is St. Francis Xavier, now the one on top, very active, but also prayerful no, in the mission, very much involved no, with uh, conversion of so many souls no, in eight countries, I think eight regions um, in large part. No? But the one below is St. Therese of Lisieux, who was only inside her cell throughout the missions. But because of her prayer, she is also considered a patron of the missions because it was through her prayer, apostolic in itself, that these things that were happening in the church during her time was made possible. In fact, the Carmelites, if I'm not mistaken, are called chaplains in a sense, spiritual sense. They take care of missions as well. So in itself, prayer has that power, uh, effectiveness. It is already apostolic. Second point um, is actually mentioned in the, uh, the, there's an explicit apostolate of prayer we talk about it, and there, in itself, implicitly, we are already giving a lot of apostolate. Prayer, also, when we talk about the church, in fact, not only is a wish, or includes a wish to be united to all Christians, but there in prayer, also, there's a value that is not easy to sort of open. No? A, box, a package is not difficult to open. It is to exercise prayer ecumenically. Now, there's a communal value of prayer because you invite people, although they may not be Catholics, to prayer and uh, you will not find so much challenges. Of course, they will not uh, pray the Hail Mary with you, but you invite people to pray no? and there's already a union of hearts. No? There is a path definitely towards ecumenism. At the same time, through prayer, there is an openness to the entire humanity. You can pick also non-Christians to pray with you. To help you, to accompany you. Now there's an openness to entire human race. 